week's programme, we're going to have a pretty good mix for you today. We're going to be talking about politics, we're going to be talking about young farmers, we're also going to be talking about Lincoln University, but in just a moment it's Farm Account. Kerry, one of the farmers out there has had his hand spanked real bad. Yeah, we've got a farmer from Waihee that's actually gone to jail for four years and nine months for basically ripping off the tax system. Um, he was running a business, a sort of organic butchery in a shop um, since 2007 and been employing staff. Never filed a POI return, GST return or even an income tax return. His attitude was he wasn't subject to tax so why did he have to do it? Uh, why would anybody think they weren't subject to tax? Oh, he had some Maori heritage behind him so he was basically arguing that because of that he didn't have to do the income oh, okay. tax because it yep. wasn't fair. So it so. was a cultural thing. Yeah, um, the reality was he was subject to the tax and he had to do it. Um, IRD rung him, tried to contact him, do all sorts of things with him. They even personally tried to deliver a letter to him, which he wouldn't accept. Um, so then they just lost patience and, and went after him. But they estimated it was about $1.4 million odd dollars worth of tax that he never actually paid up. In a situation where people are bounced by the IRD, do they still have to pay that? Does that normally work? Yeah, if they've got assets available, they'll try and take those as sort of to cover anything that's there. Um, but most of these people by that point have either got rid of them or spent the money on other things and or made them disappear. Yeah, no, that's a fair comment yeah. because people do make money disappear. Yes. Now, the ACC rates have changed. Yeah, from the 1st of April, we've got some changes. So there's a, but everyone's been paying a residual levy as part of ACC, and that's going. That was from a legacy from you know, accidents from pre-1999. Um, and as a way of funding them, well, the government have said that's gone as from the 1st of April. So what will that mean? It means that for most people it's going to be slightly cheaper um, okay. in terms of ACC. Um, and especially for employees, it means that not so much is going to be taken out of their pays. So it's a bit of a bonus for them there. Yeah, we haven't heard much about that. <laughs> no, and then the other side of it is they're now going to make sure that your ACC as a farmer reflects the industry that you're in. So they're going to look at accidents that have <clears> happened and also the likelihood of accidents and judge your ACC rate on that. So. Fear to say that for most farmers they might be paying more, um, but for a lot of other businesses they reckon about 50 odd percent of them will actually pay less. Yeah, and Kerry, please tell me they sorted this worm farming thing out because I mean that that was that was stupidity at the end. Yes, um, it still comes under agriculture, but I, there is a bit of discretion there. I mean that was a percentage, wasn't it? Yeah. It was because worm farmers was a minute. Yes. Yeah. It was, yeah. It's so, just totally out of perspective. Yeah, so yeah, okay. yeah. yeah so they've, they've done that change. They've also, for motor vehicles, there's a reduction in the average ACC on the motor vehicles. So when you go to rent <coughs> your vehicle, it should be cheaper in the, in the future. So it's another sort of cost saving that will flow through the bottom line for everyone, which is a positive. It is positive. Mm. And mortgages? Yeah, um, obviously with interest rates low, we've getting a lot of inquiries about what to do with the, their mortgages. Um, people have got them sitting on floating or they're coming off fixed. And we get the question is, you know, should we fix it? Should we stay on floating? Um, we know the OCR rate by the Reserve Bank could probably change in the next few months. So looking at it, one to two years is probably your best option if you want to fix. Um, but having said that, you actually need to go and talk to your bank and sort of work out what your risk profile is and what suits you the best. Mm. Um, and bankers do have some sort of an idea, I assume? Oh, yeah, they know roughly where things are going. They know what suits you. Um, they can see your debt loading, for example. They can say you might want to split it up into two or three portions rather than have one huge loan and then split it over you know, different time periods so you can take advantage of the rates. Um, a few people are looking at the long term, so they want to get a, a certainty, so they're fixing it for four or five years now. The downside of this is actually going to cost a lot more. Um, if the rates come down, you're going to be paying, paying well above where you really need to be. Mm. Um, so you need to think about the next couple of years is probably your best option. But the other thing is, when you see the interest rate, don't take that as the interest rate. Um, the banks can negotiate and will negotiate. So you've sort of go in and say, well, I see you're advertising you know, 4.3, for example, but you might be at 4.1 in the end if you push them hard. It's a case of just asking the question and, and saying to them, you know, what's your best rate? We know what your carded rate is, but they do have better. So that's interesting, that, that, and that, because it is competitive out there. Oh, yeah, definitely. And the banks are chasing hard. Um, so it is a good idea to go and talk to a couple of banks as well. So talk to your bank you've got your debt with and go and find someone else and sort of play them off against each other. Um, it <laughs> works very well. It's amazing the deals you can get as a result. So that, that's sort of like when you get these mortgage brokers, isn't it? Because they do that for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Mortgage brokers are an option. Um, and of course they cost you nothing because the banks pay the commission to them. So it's always an idea to, to get them on board and have a look for you. 
uh, and they know exactly who's offering what deals and and it may be a bank that you haven't even thought of so well worth uh, I'm a great fan of brokers out. I mean I've always put my insurance through an insurance broker for yeah. that reason oh definitely yeah we use brokers for all our sort of stuff so yeah mortgages insurance that sort of thing you definitely go and use a broker make them do the hard work for you and get you the best deal mm. um, they know all the tricks of the trade and, and who's doing what and the other thing is when it comes to insurance, for example, and I'm sorry, I am sort of digressing a bit, <laughs> but, but you know, if you've got a broker that's got several million dollars with somebody, they are taken seriously yes. when it comes to your claim. Yeah, ex exactly, yeah, and, and they know exactly how to get a claim through in the quickest way possible, yeah. which and is important. A, and what's available. Because exactly. I did, I yeah. could, after the earthquakes, I couldn't read all the small print. I had no idea what it all meant. Yeah, you know, they, they know all the ins and outs, and so well worth using a broker. And because and it costs you nothing as well, so it's always a good thing. Hmm. What's happening with the payroll situations? Well, we're just we're coming up to the 1st of April, you know, the payroll year for employees ends. Um, so we're just flagging people to, to think about how they're doing their payroll and whether they keep doing it the way they are. So some people are doing it in a book for five or six employees, um, whether there could actually be other options out there. They might want to outsource to, say, an accountant or an online provider or even move to software. Um, also, just to think about all their obligations that they've got to meet. Um, we've seen one or two instances where farmers forget to pay on the KiwiSaver employer contribution or you know, an employee's opted to go into KiwiSaver and they've never actually worked it out. And then of course further down the track the employees come and said, well how come I'm not getting that you know, as part of my, <coughs> my pay? And they, they go, oh I didn't realise. But you know, So just things like that to think about your payroll, tidy it up, especially your payroll records. Uh, you know, you've got to keep accurate records of holidays and sick leave and those sort of things which are all the vulnerabilities that most people get tripped up on. Mm. So if you've got if you've got an accountant, for example, your DAA, do you do the PAYE or do you get... Yeah, no, we've got um, quite a few. Um, we've probably got 30 or 40 farmers that we actually do the pay, payrolls for. Even just, you know, we've got one where he's only got one staff member who pays fortnightly. He just hands it all to us and we take full responsibility for it. And that way, you know, he doesn't have to worry about it. He just sends the hours <laughs> through and, and we look at after it and, you know, make sure the staff member's paid, IRD have filed on time, etc. So it makes it easy. Thank yeah. you very much indeed, Kerry. And in just a moment, we'll be talking to Joe Goodhue about things including trade. Joe, the grassroots level, how are things looking? Yeah, it's tough out there for people in primary industries right now. And I think part of the, the t is even for those who are actually making ends meet at the moment, rather than going backward, they're well aware that there are others around them that they need to look out for. I guess that's where I see a big difference between now and the 80s. I think that the New Zealand rural sector, in, in a tough year, actually more than one tough year, they're linking arms and that's everybody right across the sector. So we've got Rural Support Trust doing a great job, but we've got farmers looking out for farmers, we've got vets looking out for farmers, we've got churches, we've got the bankers, we've got the accountants, actually anyone interacting with the, the rural sector seems to have taken it on board right now that we need to be looking after each other and that's what happens when the t going gets tough. We saw it in response to the Christchurch earthquakes. We're seeing it now in response to Fiji. That's the way we do it. So it's really a community going shoulder to shoulder? I think so. I think so. And, and you know, people in business go through tough times. It doesn't matter whether their business is very urban based or whether it's more rural based. Um, tough times are part of being in business and in farming, it's always up and down and those of us that have been associated with, with farming for a long time know that. But when it is down like it is right now, um, it's great to see others reaching out, you know, even from urban areas reaching out to the farmers saying what can we do. Um, and I think there's great resilience there because people feel in the main quite well supported. And there's a very bright light at the end of the tunnel, Joe. Yes, I believe so. And when we look across New Zealand at the people capability that's being built, and Young Farmers Organisation is certainly helping other organisations in that space. When we look at innovation, and this week I've been at the opening of the mozzarella plant at Clandy Boy, um, a place I grew up where it was cheese. And, you know, cheese in fact was the non-value added product that we kept saying we needed to do better on. That mozzarella cheese is going to be going in after six hours preparation instead of um, 12 weeks preparation, it's going into a $38 billion sector around the world. And New Zealand's got a great advantage now because we can do it so much faster. So that's the sort of innovation that'll take us forward. 
but it comes back to people. So training the people at places like Lincoln University, um, something we can be proud of here in Canterbury. Um, but young farmers organisations helping us to get those 50,000 extra people into the primary industries, that's the sort of standing shoulder to shoulder again. Straight after the break, we'll be talking to Dennis Carter about things cropping. Be Active begins here, in the cold, clean, unpolluted southern oceans of New Zealand. Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. Natural, 100% pure. Manufactured from healthy, deep-sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. The way the world is growing. Working with nature. Good for the plant. Good for the planet. Now that's growing for good. I've been reporting on farming matters on the radio and newspapers and on television for 40 or so years, but communication, like farming, has moved on. So we've come up with On The Land, online and through YouTube on any screen, anytime and anywhere. Just push play and see and hear what's happening today in our rural community. You'll learn and be informed about the latest and best information farming matters. On The Land, bringing farming information into the 21st century. So join us on our website, ontheland.co.nz. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Dennis, we've obviously got harvest underway, so therefore you look at fire or do you not burn? Well, stubble fires specifically, Rob, what I'm really um, meaning is that um, what's happening is a lot of do-gooders, the, the uh, um, Rural population has changed. There's been a lot of people from the city come out and live in the, live in the country, and uh, first puff of smoke, and they ring the fire brigade. And so what's happening is that uh, the fire brigades out there um, chasing smoke. In other words, they know and the locals know that it's a stubble fire, and stubble fires generally last between about ten minutes and quarter of an hour, and it's all <laughs> yes. over. Yes. And and they have a pattern, a bit like a you know a mushroom from a from a nuclear bomb sort of thing, goes off quickly and that type of thing. And it's a um, different colour. And it's a different colour. And, and so it's, it's crazy. Um, what's happened is the restrictions are back on now. Now, people will read that in the, in the media and they'll think, right, first puff of smoke, oh, that restrictions are on, ring the fire brigade. Wrong. Stubble burning in the Selwyn district is still allowed under the controlled uh, situation. Yep, and of, permitted. Of, well, no, not necessarily, don't need to be permitted. A 10 metre um, wide uh, fire break with no um, organic matter in that fire break, so we're probably talking about ploughing rather than grubbing, and, and certainly mowing <coughs> and, and tedding to get a decent uh, uh, clear piece of land, and um, in attendance with, uh, with water uh, available or firefighting facilities available yourself. And most farmers have sprayers that are, that are set up to... Uh, or, yeah, or motorbikes and all sorts of things mm -hmm. set up to uh, look after it. So that's allowable as well as burning in drums on the farm so or on, on the household in drums. So um, these things are still, even though the restrictions are on, they're still available. But what's going to happen, the media will say restrictions are back on. People will say, right, first puff of smoke, pick up the phone. The, the question is, verify that it is a fire out of control first, or yep. all the volunteer fire brigades are just going to be out all the time, yep. chasing smoke. Chasing smoke, literally. Crazy. Yeah. Now, karate insecticide. Yes, Rob, there's been, um, far I've done some trials on uh, control of insects, mainly aphid 
in um, winter cereals, and, and they're a bad vector of barley yellow dwarf virus in wheat. And so the question farmers have always had, had is, is which is the longest lasting, which is the best, um, which should I choose, because there's so many on the market. So for winter wheat, um, when it's applied in the winter period uh, to control those autumn flights that come in, Karate has come out on top, uh, a synthetic pyrethroid, 25 days protection. Uh, some of the new, it's probably a bit uh, hard on some of the uh, other uh, beneficials. It's, it's quite uh, broad spectrum. Yep. With some so of the newer look ones. Look after your bees. Yeah, well, bees, ladybirds, um, lacewing, all those types of things. Um, so certainly some of the other newer ones are a little kinder, but they mightn't last as long as we would like to think they do. But put karate into a uh, summer situation, it doesn't last as long. So it's not always the same, but certainly in that winter wheat, controlling aphid for barley yellow dwarf virus, it, uh, it's doing the job. 25 days is not bad. No, exactly. Yep. And I guess it's the time of the year when we start thinking about rats and mice, literally. Yes, literally. They, they also vacate the fields at this time of year um, with, with, once the crop's been taken off. And certainly you'd hope you'd get one or two of them in a, uh, in a stubble fire. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah hopefully. <laughs> yeah. But they, they, they start to feel the, the dew and the, and the cold and they start moving indoors to, uh, into houses, into, into barns, into um, silos, sheds, that they can silos get everywhere, hay sheds, that type of thing. And a lot of people waste a lot of rat bait um, feeding rats and mice. And you, what you should do is actually pulse it. So one feed will actually kill a rat or a mouse but it takes about two to three weeks, and they still will continue to eat for two to three weeks. And people say, oh, the rat bait's gone, so renew, 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 wasted. You're not gonna kill any other population, so the answer is pulse feeding. Is you, you, you put some out, monitor it, it will go. So as long as everybody in that population, the rats and mice have had a go at it, uh, they are history, just give it time perhaps uh, rebate again in a month's time, and there could be a new population in. Mm. And so that, that's the way to handle them, and it works well. And speaking of nasty little critters, slugs. Slugs, they are tough, and people will say, okay, drought, uh, stubble fires, things like that, no problem. But they live down, um, they live down the cracks in the soil, or you've fostered them through your wonderful irrigation. You've kept them going. Yeah, they love uh, irrigation. They love irrigation and under clover crops and things like that. So you, th you think the season's in your favour, but you've done something to favour the pest. And so just be aware of, of those irrigated um, pastures or especially things like uh, white clover. The next crop, there'll be plenty there. So, um, That's right. yep. And that leads us onto grass grubs. Grass grubs, there's been plenty of beetle flying, people have seen that, and we've talked about irrigation making the ground soft, particularly uh, crops that were planted in the spring. The soil is loose rather than an autumn one, uh, and so the beetles can lay their eggs, they can dig holes in that uh, loose soil, and they will survive away from the sun. So expect the uh, grass crop to really rip in over the next three months. Do you heavy roll it, or what do you do? Well, it's really a cultivation or insecticide uh, issue really um, heavy rolling won't really do um, mob stocking of cattle will do a job but it has to be mob stocked of a big cattle but of course while they're doing the job in the grass grub they're pugging your soil <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's a no one isn't it <laughs> no one. so yeah. now the other thing is I guess people should be looking at their rotations yes farmers are getting a little concerned at the moment about you know what am I going to grow and and I would say to them grow some cereals but as least of them as you can um, because it's not looking that good that the silos are full, um, but it will it will filter away. But look at other options. Um, look at your rotation very carefully because no matter what the price, a half crop grown in the wrong field is a very very expensive exercise. So um, you may go out grow a crop that's at a lower income, but if you have a good one, it will always pay its way. And it is a time of adjustment for you cropping farmers. Yes, huge change, time of adjustment, same as uh, with the dairy farmers really, and uh, there is a few positives out there. World needs food, um, interest rates are low, New Zealand dollars are reasonably favourable, and of course uh, fuels are lower in price and um, inflation is low, so there are some positives. There are indeed, there. thank you very much yeah. indeed. In just a moment we'll be hearing the latest from Tom Lambie about Lincoln University. 
Tom, some very exciting news coming out of Lincoln. Yes, definitely. Um, one of the things that's really important to us is the student numbers. Uh, we've got a 9% registered uh, increase in first year students, uh, new to Lincoln students, and um, that's fantastic because that's really supporting the land-based industries. It's very important that young people coming through and learning lots. Absolutely. and. Um, you know, the, the great thing with Lincoln is that what we do is we do a lot of very specialised uh, research. Uh, we bring that and collate it together and then when, we, when we're looking for students that we're turning out from the university, uh, they actually understand a systems approach uh, that puts all of that research into context of what they're going to deal with in the real world, uh, which makes our students incredibly valuable. It's not just farming. Oh, it's definitely not just farming people. Farming people are incredibly important because we really need to have the best expertise behind the farm gate. Uh, but if New Zealand and the agricultural industries are going to succeed, uh, then we need uh, the people with the skills throughout the whole value chain. So that can be supply chain management, it can be processing, it can be in the marketing. Um, it's a whole range of industries, including the banking, uh, that actually will be the pieces of the puzzle that really drives uh, future wealth and um, real prosperity for this country. Is farming becoming sexy at last? Oh, it's becoming incredibly sexy and I guess one of the things that we're finding is that we're actually dealing with all of today's big challenges. Uh, so we want to grow and we want to be prosperous, we want to be able to deliver the hospitals and the schools and everything that we want. At the same time, uh, we've really got to deal with the issues around climate change, around the environment, um, where we actually are making sure that we've got production systems uh, that deliver the type of outcomes that all New Zealanders want as well. And that's the complexity of farming, uh, but it's a challenge that as the industry uh, and as Lincoln University we're taking on. After the break, we're going to be talking about Young Farmers, RX Plastics and Tony Deverin. Be Active begins here in the cold, clean, unpolluted Southern Oceans of New Zealand. Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. Natural, 100% pure. Manufactured from healthy deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. The way the world is growing. Working with nature. Good for the plant. Good for the planet. Now that's growing for good. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Welcome back to the program. In just a moment, we're going to be talking irrigation. Phil Kaline's been around for a long, long time now, but now you've got it into a farm pack. Yes, essentially, Rob, what we've done is we've taken all of the learnings that we've had over the last 20 years of Kalon and we've accumulated that into a single package. So I guess it's sort of cash and carry. Uh, absolutely, yeah. DIY, if we wanted to use that term, uh, essentially this will do up to a hectare. Uh, and obviously uh, we're shifting it from place to place to place to make up the hectare, but that's the normal principle of Kalon anyway. Five pods in a pack, would that do about a hectare? Uh, up to a hectare, yeah, and it's really important, especially in this season, it's hot and it's dry, uh, very strong El Nino, probably the strongest since 1950. So it's important that we actually make sure that we don't end up with fry risks uh, and actually keep the grass uh, green anyway. Especially around the house and farm buildings? Uh, absolutely, yeah, I mean that's very important because clearly we don't want to have those things happen. 
the ideal for small blocks and, and uh, horticulturalists? Uh, absolutely so. Um, we can apply a very uh, small amount of water over a long time period with K-Line. So we're applying the water efficiently and that's uh, really part of the smart irrigation uh, process that is actually being enacted at the moment. Um, so we're trying to do it right. Uh, we want to apply a small amount over a longer period, get all of that absorbed into the soil. Do you give advice on what size pump you're going to need? Um, a lot of the information that comes with the uh, product actually has a lot of that information with it. So we can determine what size pump uh, you'd actually require to do the job. Although obviously there are a lot of professionals out there who supply pumps and they'll be able to provide that information. Calling it a farm pack, but I guess people who have got sports grounds and parks would also be right in the market. Uh, absolutely, and in fact if you look around there's uh, a lot of sports fields that are now irrigated with K-Line um, and that's really about making the soil soft enough that actually when people fall over or trip or actually don't break bones and cause major um, health risks. So we're actually trying to make, make it better. In a sports field sense also, the simpler that you can make uh, the process the more likely it is to be adopted. And often uh, in those areas, they're looking for people to do that who are uh, retired. Um, actually, the more complicated you make it, the more difficult it is for people to pick up. A dust is going to be a major problem this summer. Well, yes, it could well be. And in fact, in a lot of uh, industrial sites where uh, they're doing subdivisions or they're uh, building, building uh, areas, we really want to keep that dust down uh, and actually K-Line you'll see on many, many subdivisions now. Now you've got a special hose, do we need to be careful when we're rolling it out and rolling it back up again? Really important when you're uncoiling the K-pipe that comes with this that you don't twist it because uh, the twist will be permanent in the pipeline. Uh, and to aid that we've put three white stripes on the pipeline uh, and so long as you have that pointing in one direction, whether it's up or down doesn't matter, um, that'll then mean that the pipe doesn't have a twist in it. Uh, and that makes it really important, because as you're shifting it, you don't want them to roll over. How foolproof is your K-Line DIY? I think it's very foolproof, but fools are very inventive, as friends of mine have said in the past, so you have to be careful with that. <laughs> But generally, no, but seriously, uh, it is actually very straightforward. To it's do. very, very straightforward, and in fact, in the manual that comes with it, it has some very clear information: what tools you require, uh, how you would lay it out, uh, the do's and don'ts of of putting K line together, uh, all in the uh, manual that comes with it. And there's also a DVD in here that uh, talks about and shows the same thing. Where do we buy them from? Uh, you'll get that from your local farm merchant or your irrigation company. Uh, they'll all have access to that. If they don't actually have it in stock, uh, they'll certainly be able to obtain it for you. Staying with the subject of irrigation, Tony, it's pretty dry out there. Uh, yeah, it's, it's extremely dry. Um, as, as I discussed last time I was in, we were heading back into what looked like sort of strengthening El Nino type conditions and that's exactly what we've got sort of the from the bottom half of the North Island sort of about the you know southern Taranaki across to the wider upper and um, then all the way down exclude the west coast because they're getting hammered. Yeah, they're getting hammered. But ex all the way down the east coast then is is really really dry I mean um, probably uh, as dry as it was pre-Christmas uh, and so as dry as it was that mm. sort of November, December 2015. So it, it's uh, unrelenting as far as um, particularly pastoral irrigation is concerned. Uh, if you've got water, it, it's absolutely required. The woody, water uses are relatively high for this time of the year. I mean, uh, even though the weather's been quite high, you know, we, we get settled weather at this time of the year, we've had very high temperatures. You know, we had a week, week to 10 days all the way down that sort of eastern freeboard and seaboard rather and also out to the western side sort of the Manawatu sort of area where we was we were sitting in the sort of 28s to 30s for for nearly nearly 10 days mm, mm. no rain 
Uh, so even though the days have shortened up, it means that when we've got those sort of conditions, then we have very high transpiration rates. So water uses are still very high. We could have done with some rain during a couple of test matches too, couldn't we? Uh, we probably could have done with some rain during a couple of test matches. Although Christchurch was okay. I mean, we were it was in the balance till the till the <laughs> Tuesday afternoon. Yeah. yeah. No, I had to bring it up yes, because I know. I know you're an absolute <laughs> fan. What are the water reserves like? Um, the water reserves have hung in there pretty well. Um, the the run of the river schemes have been on and off, on and off, on and off. Um, we tend to get. Uh, quite big flushes from the northwesterlies in in those rivers, both in sort of the uh, southern in that wider wrapper area, and then the east coast of the South Island. We get those, we're getting those flushes, but they're they're relatively short lived, so they come and go quite quickly. And uh, so we go from being restri having restricted water to having plenty of water, going back to restricted water again. So, um, yeah, the, the the run of the river is sort of hanging in there and sort of getting people through. Uh, groundwater is okay, but mm -hmm. the concern with groundwater is that uh, is that we're we're depleting the reserve of groundwater that we've got. Uh, we know that from a lysimeter site that we that we monitor at the Christchurch Airport that we've had no drainage, so nothing below nothing has drained below two meters in the profile since about September two thousand fifteen. Really. Uh, so even though we had what were quite reasonable rains in the in you know Christmas and that early part of New Year of the New Year, it was insufficient to refill the the deficit in that. It's a dryland site, uh, non-irrigated, so there was insufficient rainfall to refill the site and therefore to get drainage to the groundwater. So the real concern now is that as we head towards the end of the irrigation season. Uh, or to, towards the end of the growing season. We've got mm. very high deficits. Um, dryland will just about not be growing at all at the moment. Uh, and we've got large deficits to replace before we're going to get groundwater recharge in the winter. So, um, you know, I think we need to hope and pray that we get uh, from about May, uh, probably mid-April really, from about mid-April through to uh, June, maybe July, um, we need to get uh, some significant rainfall events in that, in that time. So yeah. we need a real switch around in the weather patterns that we've got right now so that we can get recharged back into the groundwater system for the next irrigation season. So while it's a long way away... It's not that far. September, you know, <laughs> yeah. we need... Because it's, there's a lag in the time from when it rains and we get excess rainfall before we get um, rises in groundwater and so more storage in the groundwater system. Tony, is there... Is a lot of interest in on-farm on storage? Uh, on-farm storage is um, useful only really as a buffer on where, you, where you've got um, irregular or intermittent um, uh, delivery from, from schemes. Mm. Uh, to store enough water to, to irrigate your farm, you have to take too much um, um, productive land out of production to make a big enough pond to, to store water. So, you know, you, you might have to take 10 or 12 hectares, sometimes 30 hectares, uh, out to yes, store enough area. water. Well, yeah, if you want to store, for example, um, you take a 200 hectare dairy farm, for example, or a finishing unit that wants to grow grass all year, if you were going to store water to get you through the irrigation season, then you're probably going to have to have a storage that's sort of 800 to a million cubic metres. So when you know you can't exceed about three meters in depth, so you've suddenly got about a thirty hectare pond uh, that you've got to fill up with water uh, in the off season, mm. or whenever you mm. can get access to excess water to fill that pond up. Uh, so they're, they're very expensive to build. You're talking about uh, three to five dollars a cubic meter to build them. Uh, so you're talking about a, a relatively large uh, capital expenditure to build a, a pond big enough to give you storage for the whole year. If you're looking for something a bit smaller, uh, just to get you by just over 10 or... the, 10 or the elbows, as it were. Well, you know, even 10 or 20 days, you've still got to have, um, you know, 50 to 100,000 cubic metres, and, you know, there's a half a million dollars just to build a pond. Mm. There's those big ones sort of just round off the Rangitata there. There's a couple oh, of decent-sized ones. Yeah, there's eight of them there. Eight uh, of them. <laughs> that's, for the, that's for the Rangitata South Irrigation Scheme. Yep. Um, so... Uh, mm -hmm. They they will only be filled in the winter, or in the actually in the spring when we get snow melt in the Rangitata and it's flowing at very high uh, high flows. So uh, you you go past them now and they'll be empty. 
Um, so only in this, only in the early late winter or early spring will they be full. And each farmer has got to have a very large storage to uh, get them by on that scheme as well. Mm. So that's what those big ponds are for. And that, that's the sort of to do the scheme rather than to do a, a farm. So. Yeah, that's to do a scheme. Yeah, but <clears throat> on each farm there has to be I forget the exact figures, but they've got to have so many two hundred cubic meters or something yeah. like that <clears throat> per hectare that they irrigate. So. Uh, that's still a sizable pond to build on your property. Yeah, good on Rooney's for doing it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, outlooking or the outlook? I should well, say. look, we are still in uh, we're still in a pretty strong El Nino weather pattern. Um, all the signs, everything's still there as far as El Nino is concerned. So southwesterly, westerly weather for the east, eastern sides of uh, of New Zealand, especially south of Hawke's Bay. Uh, so, you know, there's no prospect in the immediate future of any significant rainfall events. In fact, I think we're probably looking out into April before we see anything serious. Tony, thank you very much indeed. In just a moment, we'll be talking to Sam War. He's the chairman for the Tasman Young Farmers, who put on a very impressive conference. Sam, a very interesting conference that you put together. Yeah, definitely a uh, very interesting conference. We've got quite a few different aspects being pulled together, um, but really looking forward to, to taking off. The theme is learn, grow and succeed. Yes, yep. So we had a real focus on uh, providing opportunities for our members to, to do all those three things. So uh, learn, learn the way they want to learn. So we've provided them a range of workshops that they can choose from. Uh, and use that as an opportunity to grow themselves and succeed into the future. You've got some pretty big hitters coming along. Yeah, ac across the whole conference we've got 25 um, guest speakers coming out, so um, really good to get industry in behind us. Uh, and that was probably one of the easiest parts of the conference actually, was getting the speakers involved. As um, soon as they hear young farmers, they, they often get right in behind, so it was really good to see. Now, Tasman's the first ones to do this? Yeah, so there's been regional conferences in the past. Um, they haven't been done uh, much sort of in the last few years, uh, but this is a, a different sort of format and, and we've changed the way in which it's been delivered. Uh, so yeah, the first one out of the seven regions to do to do this sort of conference now. And it's pretty exciting times for people to get involved with farming. Mm, very exciting. There's so many opportunities um, and so many people willing to back young people at the moment uh, and it's just a matter of getting behind it and sort of using that and making the most out of it. Young farmers did go quiet for a while, but you're coming back out again. Yes, yep. um, Young Farmers has gone through a bit of a lull, um, as, as these things do, um, but there's a really good team in behind uh, growing that now and, and providing, I guess, value back to members and showing people what great opportunities can come from being part of Young Farmers, for sure. And it's not just farmers? No, exactly. There's, we've got uh, nurses, uh, pilots, we've got a range of different um, people involved in Young Farmers, uh, so definitely not just for farmers. but. They're certainly centred around the, the primary industries, I suppose. You become a very wide net as far as primary industries is concerned. Yeah, well, I suppose um, something Joe was talking about <coughs> earlier on was around the diversification within the uh, the primary industry sector, and how how that's changed in the last uh, number of years. And I guess that's pulled in a lot of those sort of other areas that people often don't associate with primary industries. So. And you yourself, you don't actually get your gum boots dirty. Not quite. Um, no, so I'm a, a dairy farm consultant, um, so I just help farmers get their gumboots dirty. <laughs> Good on Tasman Young Farmers. After the break, we're going to be talking to Jim Gresson about horticulture and off the grid with Lincoln University. Be active begins here in the cold, clean, unpolluted southern oceans of New Zealand. Be active amino acid biostimulant, natural. 100% pure, manufactured from healthy deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. The way the world is growing. Working with nature, good for the plant, good for the planet. Now that's growing for good. I've been reporting on farming matters on the radio and newspapers and on television for 40 or so years, but communication, like farming, has moved on. So we've come up with On The Land, online and through YouTube on any screen, anytime and anywhere. Just push play and see and hear what's happening today in our rural community. You'll learn and be informed about the latest and best information farming matters. On The Land, bringing farming information into the 21st century. So join us on our website, ontheland.co.nz. You know that saying, content is king? 
Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Off the grid is becoming quite popular. It is, yeah. Um, it's been a, a few changes. Um, the price of things has really gone down, so the price of solar um, panels has, has really plummeted. Um, there's a lot more industry that's um, able to you know, install a system for you. Um, wind turbines, um, rural wind turbines, um, again, have, have really become quite commercial now. Batteries? Uh, yeah, that's probably the other really big thing. Um, battery systems ha have come down in price and there's some really new big battery systems that are really designed for say a, a residential property off the grid um, that, are, that are really just come into the market. Some of that battery technology is actually being motivated by um, electric vehicle technology and also technology advancements in, in um, power electronics or small electronic devices. So yeah, huge technical advances, much lower prices, and therefore becoming off-grid is actually becoming um, commercially viable um, for, for a, lot more, a lot more people these days. It must be changing a bit because most people thought of off-the-grid as sort of men with long hair and women with hairy legs and, and hippie type situations. Yeah, not nowadays really. Um, it's becoming much more... Um, in an ind independence thing, um, people don't want to be subjected to really high prices from the um, power companies. Um, residential prices have escalated up, um, have increased a lot recently. And yeah, um, going sort of off-grid, um, even going partially off-grid if you're still tied to the grid for a residential house within the city, um, becoming really popular for a wide variety of people. Are you looking at dairying and irrigation at all? Yeah, I think they're possibly at this point in time a little bit too challenging for off the grid. Um, we do use a lot of um, power, electricity uh, for, for dairy, especially within the Canterbury region, uh, for irrigation and also to, to run your, your, your dairy sheet. Um, we've actually had a student just look at all of those energy, not only the electricity, but um, all the energy that goes into fertiliser, that goes into all the other equipment on farm. Um, and yeah, it is quite substantial, um, especially with intensification that's happened recently um, in the Canterbury region. The one thing we've actually found is that although we're using a lot more energy, a lot more power, a lot more fertilisers, and we're becoming a lot more intensive within dairy, we're actually being just as efficient. So although we're putting a lot more in, we are actually producing a lot more milk at the end of the day. And um, so actually, Competitively, compared to other countries, um, we've actually still got this real competitive advantage um, over other countries in terms of producing dairy. And obviously anybody who's living well out of town is going to be looking very favourably at being off the grid. Yeah, if, if they've got a house and they're well out of town, um, then the cost of connecting to that grid is, is really expensive. Um, just that, that extra bit of line from your house to, to the um, edge of the road, so to speak, can be really expensive um, per metre. So in those applications, um, an off-the-grid system um, can actually provide a better, better system, um, cheaper system in the long run, long run for, for those people. I'd like to take you back to the mid-1980s. We had very, very severe droughts and we had very, very low prices and very, very high interest rates and things were very, very tough. Now, the reason I've taken you back to the mid-1980s is literally because at that point, there were a lot of women who decided for one reason or another that they wanted to go into business. For example, there's a lady who was married to a farmer and they were farming not far from North Canterbury, <clears throat> they were getting $12 for a lamb. 
And this particular lady said, well, what say I grow some gypsophila? And I could sell gypsophila to the florist. She was getting for six stems of gypsophila, $20. Remember her husband was getting $12 for a lamb. At that stage also, we had a group of four women in North Canterbury and Colverden, in fact, and they said, what can we do to help our respective husbands? Because the prices are so bad, the interest rates are so high, and everything is against them. They came up with what is now a very established piece of North Canterbury, for the want of a better term, called the Colverden Fate, which is always run in November, and it's got bigger and bigger and bigger and attracts more and more people. My point is that with things getting pretty tough for farming at the moment, perhaps it is time for women to actually have a look, or men as well, to have a look at what they're doing and say, what can we do to bring in some extra cash? Because it's very easy to live within the bounds that you have set yourself. I had the privilege of talking to Jo Taylor from Latitudes and Bridal Magazine in Ashburton. She got into business even though she was farming with her husband and a very intensive farm too, I might say, she decided because somebody said, I would dearly love to have a glossy magazine I could advertise in, she produced one. Now she's got her own little empire and I can tell you she's winning awards left, right and centre for her entrepreneurialism. I think I said that right. But anyway, cut a long story short, her message to people such as you is, if you're passionate, you'll do it. If you back yourself, you'll do it. I just thought I'd actually just mention that because times are tough and you may not pay yourself for the first 12 months or so, but if you've got the passion and you've got the drive and you can back yourself, you'll be absolutely astounded what you can create. Jim, it's um, getting pretty dry out there again. Yes, it certainly is, Rob. Um, continuation now, we had a really nice rain in the third week of January throughout most of New Zealand, to be honest, and a, and a really good one around the uh, South Island. Unfortunately, it's all disappeared quite rapidly. And there's been the odd northerly come through Nelson with a bit of rain with it. But to be honest, it's extremely dry. And with the uh, autumn autumn sort of coming into, into vogue at the same time, there's a lot of uh, evapotranspiration going on with still a lot of the bushes and vines and whatever. They've got a lot of leaf area. So that's they're sucking a lot of water out of the ground. Probably about three to four mils by the way the monitoring is going per day. Mm -hmm. So uh, if the grower's got a cycle of say three, say 10 days to 14 days, he's gonna have to put 30, 40 mils of rain on to try and uh, keep, keep that in balance. And of course that's not really happening because the guys don't realize just how dry it is. We always say when you've got the screaming nor'westers, you, you've got evapotranspiration racing out the door. We haven't got the north stream screaming the oysters, but we've still got evapotranspiration, mainly because we've got really hot days and quite warm evenings until the last couple of days, which has started to cool down again. Mm. So true water, you know, dew in the morning, uh, cooler nights now. Hopefully that'll can't carry on, because what that does to apples and uh, stone fruit, it, it brings up their colour a lot more with the differentiation between the temperatures during the day and during the evening. And hopefully that'll continue as the harvest gets, gets well underway. As you say, we're into autumn. <coughs> special things that we should be doing in autumn. Well, one of the things is a, is a lot of clean-up spray, especially in the soft fruits. So the berries, uh, black currants, uh, strawberries, raspberries, uh, stone fruits. Those sort of what we call soft fruits. They they need to be cleaned up. With an, uh, there's a lot of uh, disease out there. Uh, it's it's not a, not a major problem to the crop that, that has just gone, but it. We don't want it to stay in the trash and, and be there coming into the springtime. So we've got to clean up. So one of the one of the very good approaches to take is to apply copper uh, in conjunction with calcium uh, ammonium nitrate or, or cal calcium nitrate, uh, in fact, 12 kgs per hectare and about a kilo of copper. And this helps to break down those leaves rapidly. Therefore, it actually helps to uh, get rid of the spores that are on those leaves. And uh, they, when they go down on the ground as trash, they get obviously in the end incorporated in the soil, but the disease in the sort of it, them, it, it's, a, it's clean yeah. before it gets there. Yeah. It's compost on steroids. Uh, yeah, well, that, <laughs> yeah, well it is really, yeah, you're right, that's a good, good explanation. Yeah. Um, I guess we should also be looking at, at the crops now that are coming off, are they looking good? Yeah, they are looking very good, uh, there's been good quality, the quantity's down a bit this year, uh, because of the frosts and, and different weather through the November, December period, but uh, what is there is good quality and it is good colour. 
Uh, but interesting enough, uh, in apples, uh, just talking to an apple uh, exporter yesterday, uh, the skins are a little soft, uh, so the starches and the sugars are down a little bit, and that's because of the heat, um, continued heat we've had. And we, uh, if they had those cooler nights and, and hotter days, uh, you get that crispiness and the starches come up and then they, they're much firmer in the, in the flesh, as it were. Uh, and we found that in uh, the berry fruit this year. It came in quite well, but it became soft very quickly. Mm. So it, it, and that's the humidity. I mean, we've had humidity throughout the country for only three months now. And especially down here in the south, it's, it's not that. It's, it's pretty unique to have that <laughs> It is actually, yeah. We don't do humidity. No, down. we don't do humidity, but <laughs> we have been. And this is brought on powdery mildew, believe it or not. Powdery, it's because it's been dry. Uh, powdery mildew is a dry disease, but it likes a bit of moist air to help it along. And there's been a lot of powdery mildew in the crops this year, post-harvest especially. And we're finding now in pumpkins and, and uh, um, yeah, pumpkins and uh, squash and what have you, that they are probably still six weeks to two months away from harvest, but they are getting powdery mildew so the growers have had to spray them. And this mm. is because of this dryish but uh, humid type conditions and warm, continual warm uh, days and nights. Um, as the autumn gets comes in and the nights become cooler, that, that'll dissipate pretty quickly. But in the meantime, it's taking the quality of the leaf away that's giving us the advantage of course. Yeah, of course, oh, yeah, that's the, the wee factory, factory, isn't it? Yeah, it is the wee factory, factory so yeah. it slows the factory down a bit. Yeah. How's the, the central Otago <coughs> fruit looking? Because it's starting to appear on roadsides up in Canterbury. Yes, yes it is. Yeah, the cherry, well, the cherries have well and truly gone, but the apricots and, and the stone fruit, now they've been really good. Uh, smaller fruit this year, but a flavour, if, if you leave... If you leave your purchasing of the fruit to about now, Central Targa will shoot me for this, but if you, if you leave it to about now, the fruit actually comes up. The, the, the sugars come up a little bit more, a little bit quicker as the harvest continues on, and you'll get that beautiful, those beautiful flavours of, the, of the, either the apricots or the nectarines or the peaches. And uh, obviously there's obviously a bit more juice in there too. Mm. But the earlier ones tend to be a little bit um, flavourless. Only, only because the sugars have They're still quite pretty come up good, yet. though. Oh, yeah, no, yeah. They, they, they are good, yeah. yeah, yeah. And yeah. they keep better in the bowl, to be honest. So, if you are buying fruit this, this time around, you need to consume it or preserve it yeah. um, pretty soon after That's purchasing good. it. Yeah. Jim, what about insects? Has there been a bit of an explosion? Yeah, there has been. With, uh, about three weeks ago, Rob, we have, we've continued to have this obviously hot weather, but the two spotted mite and uh, the gooseberry mite. Uh, two mites that are quite prevalent in the South Island, well they are in the North Island too, but quite prevalent in the South Island, especially in berry crops and in apple crops and what have you. Can't do a lot about them in apple crops because we're obviously harvesting Yeah, them. exactly. But the post-harvest applications of all those other soft fruits that I was talking about before, they need to be sprayed for two spotted mite, especially in, in the Canterbury Central Targa regions um, and lesser extent Nelson. But up in Nelson they've got, got a lot more gooseberry mite and both of those mites get into the buds for next year's buds and they make them sterile. So, and you, so you need to get rid of those pretty mm. quickly. Absolutely. And there are two or three good materials that, are, that work very well in these conditions we've got now, especially one called Omite 30W. Um, you spray it on, and you think it hasn't done a job, and about six days later, all the mite are dead. It takes about five or six days to actually work for them to ingest and then for them to die. And then, the, though it's also oversidal, so their next batch of eggs is going to get cleaned out too. And uh, and the predators come along, and they're the good the good people. They come along and uh, they, eat, they eat all the old eggs and what have you up. So it cleans up the crop very, very nicely. But you need to allow uh, about three to five days post-harvest, post-application to see a result. Because mm. the number of growers are spraying. So don't go out and do it again. Yeah, they're done. They're done. So it doesn't work. We're going to do it again. No, 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 don't do that. Don't spend <laughs> your money twice. So, uh, yeah, no, it does work very well. But the two-spotted mite is quite, quite um, rampaging out there at the moment, as it were. How are the crops, very briefly? I mean, are they looking good for next year? Oh, at this stage, yeah, they are, actually. Uh, the good thing about horticulture, we've actually got water, so most of the growers are introducing water when they when they are required. Um, but initiation is, goes on for about two months, and it's probably halfway through that and now in most crops. So at this stage, providing we start to get a real autumn, uh, we should be pretty good going to spring. Brilliant. <coughs> Jim, thank you very much indeed. And yeah, thank get you. Get that C to vitamin C was the trick. <laughs> now, if you'd like to see Jim's interview again, you can find that, of course, on our website, which is ontheland.co.nz. I'm Rob Coat Williams. You've either been watching or you've just missed the program, but I will be back at the same time next week. Until then, bye now.